Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, so for those watching online, I, I'm Benjamin Bratton, the program director of the New Normal program here at the Strelka Institute in Moscow. And I welcome you to day two of year three uh, project presentations. We have three projects today, um, all extremely interesting. So um, thank you for coming on this warm and balmy day in, in, in Moscow and joining us for this conversation. So we ended yesterday, we'll pick up where we left off. We ended yesterday with uh, one exploration of the relationship between cinema and the city in the age of the GPU. We talked about how cinema had become part of mobile media and how mobile media has become part of the city. The next two projects deal, consider the mobile, the black slab that we carry around with us, but in, in, in quite different ways. They both explore the space of fiction, but not fictions about real cities, rather the role of fictions in how we actually live in real cities. So first, uh, with the first project presence, we look into the mirror where we see another kind of model, the self. It is the self you imagine, the self you fashion, uh, the self you express, the self that is comprised bit by bit into the platform profile. And in this way, platforms are also a kind of predictive simulation. Advertisers or states or both aggregate profile models to predict what people may do next. So again, for example, Amazon at recommendation engines are based on predictive simulations, uh, which in turn are based on what you looked at and bought and didn't buy in the past and most likely to want to buy next. The present, the present moment, is what turns the model of the future into the past. But you know that, we all know that. We all know that the, we all know on a certain level that the choices that are presented to us are personalized just for us based on how the platform has constructed a profile, a shadow version of us. And the platform is in conversation with that shadow version, and in turn, we are in conversation with both at once. The next project, Presence, is about that negotiation. More specifically, it's about what choice is or even needs to be when we see ourselves in the model version of ourselves or when we don't see ourselves in that or when we're not sure if we do or not. So one of the research themes for this year for the whole program was what we call the inverse uncanny valley or in, instead of that is instead of an unease by seeing the creature that is not quite human we may be disturbed by seeing ourselves through the eyes of the machinic other not as we imagine ourselves to be but perhaps more as we are. That too is a negotiation. So, confronted with the prediction of what you will do next, do you do it or do you refuse to do it? And if you refuse to do it, doing so trains the model and so the thing that you did instead when you refused is now the prediction and the choice that it presents to you tomorrow. Do you do it then? Presence. Hello, I'm Gleb. I'm from Russia and I do Asian studies. Hi, I'm Igor. I'm an architect and urban designer from Zagreb, Croatia. Hey, my name is Artem. I'm an architect from Russia. Hi, my name is Sveta. I'm art curator and art mediator. I'm from Russia, and we are presence. Presence. 
，并帮助你更好的安排时间。Presence 在本地城市收集你的数据，为你提供更多见解。Presence 允许你将你的虚拟双胞胎发生到你想要的城市，创造属于你自己的多元宇宙。Presence 让你深入了解你可能居住在其他地方的多种生活。我们的未来让人兴奋吗？我们的未来让人兴奋吗？ You leave digital traces every time you interact with internet services. Just as your personal data is used to give you recommendations, it can be used for making predictions about your future actions. Presence is a platform that processes your behavioral data to create a quantified version of you, the predicted self. The predicted self shows you the possible futures in your city that are likely going to happen to you in the days ahead. By building the platform, Presence highlights the phenomena of predictive self-sensing, a feeling that you experience when you see your computer-generated future reflected back to you. Based on the predicted self, Presence allows you to create synthetic replicas and deploy them to any distant environment. Presence grants you insight into the multiple lives you might be living somewhere else. You can subscribe to your synthetic replicas on social media to observe their actions through the feed they generate. Presence creates your own social network, a social multiverse of the self. While building the platform, Presence explores the phenomenon of predictive self-sensing and the side effects of the platform through the cinematic language. Presence connects to existing interfaces as a plugin. You can activate Presence in your calendar by sliding the button. Once you turn on Presence, it automatically creates your predicted self. You will see days with the prediction marker since the day of activation. When you open a day, you see the schedule and details with your own plans in color blue, combined with the predictions of your future activity in Presence color from the predicted self. If you follow the predictions, they change the color to blue. The algorithm behind Presence calculates every decision you make, whether to follow or not to follow the prediction, in order to provide you the more accurate scenario of your future. Меня зовут Катя. Мне 25 лет. Я живу в Москве. Я учусь, работаю, увлекаюсь спортом, искусством и музыкой. Я довольно рассеянная, поэтому не успеваю планировать свои дела и встречи, и часто опаздываю. Я решила стать более организованной, поэтому начала пользоваться платформой Presence, которая помогла мне составить мое расписание через моего цифрового двойника. Я не перестала опаздывать, но двойник помог мне скорректировать мой день в соответствии с моим поведением. И это простило мне жизнь. Вчера мне показалось, что двойник начал в прямом смысле контролировать мою жизнь, и это начало меня пугать. Я решила остаться дома и посмотреть на реакцию платформы. 
целый день двойник присылал мне уведомления, пытаясь предсказать, что я делаю. Эта платформа предположила, что я поехала на работу, и что я опаздываю. И в итоге двойник предсказал, что до конца дня я останусь дома. Я решила не пользоваться платформой какое-то время и попыталась самостоятельно наладить свою жизнь. Я поменяла режим и начала грамотно планировать свое время. Спустя неделю я не выдержала и проверила свой календарь. Это невероятно, но мое расписание полностью соответствовало тому, что предсказала Presence. Presence connects to existing interfaces as a plugin. You can activate Presence in your maps by sliding the button. You will see a notification about the algorithm of predictions. To activate synthetic replicas in other cities, click the button in the right upper corner. When you click on the city from the list, you activate your synthetic replica in the chosen urban environment. Synthetic replicas reproduce and predict your tracks in Presence color in the chosen cities to act there just as if you would start living there. You can't control your synthetic self-replicas other than by adjusting your own patterns of behavior in real life in your native city. Ну что, как с работой? Здорово, слушай. Пока не очень. Я еще активно отправил очень много писем по всему миру, вообще никаких ответов. Даже в Японию уже отправил в несколько компаний, и ничего нету. Ты помнишь, мы тогда обсуждали вот это приложение Presence? Я поставил, но оно ничего не предлагает, потому что я сижу дома постоянно, и мои виртуальные двойники по всему миру тоже по домам. Поэтому я просто придумал последний шанс. Буду ходить в Сколково каждый день, просто сидеть там и... Если удастся убедить приложение, что я там работаю, то оно начнет мне предлагать варианты в других городах. И может сработать, не знаю, что думаешь? Может и сработает, не знаю.
Presence connects to existing interfaces as a plugin. You can activate Presence in your Instagram by sliding the button. You can follow the profiles of your synthetic replicas just as you would subscribe to the real people. They produce computer-generated posts and stories which become a part of your Instagram feed. You can also follow synthetic replicas of other people if they have opened public access of their replicas within Instagram. You can access Presence at Presence.City. Once you enter the website, you can see more information about the platform. When you go to the media page, you can watch artistic explorations of the possible side effects of the platform in the cinematic form. In these scenarios, Presence collaborates with artists and steps beyond the generic functions of the platform to explore wider social implications of the phenomena of predictive self-sensing. Multi Welt is an example of the successful collaboration between Presence and a famous artist, Palmer Eldritch. I was always interested in how urban environments shape our behavior as humans. Cities have their own contexts, and those contexts play a crucial role in who we are and what we can do. For Multi Welt, I've collaborated with Presence. I've spent over a year training my synthetic self in my hometown, a place with the highest murder rates in the country. I've deployed my synthetic replicas to cities that would challenge anyone's existence in the context of urban violence and hardship. This is what I want in a turbine hall, places that suffer humans and humans that suffer cities. When you're really thinking about ideas with him or working with him, it's like being with a group of people, not just one person. And that's really fascinating. It's about simultaneous realities, and those realities are not reflections of each other. He has a different conception of time than most people I've worked with. When we were all young, there was a kind of... like an urgency, right? And you'll almost do anything at some point some points just to keep moving to prove that you exist in the world didn't seem to have that same urgency it's like he had a different understanding of time and i've realized that this is connected to how he sees an artwork or a project developing that he doesn't see things in a linear way great 
formal strength when he makes physical sculpture. He has made some very remarkable films. Uh, the idea of the future as a constantly evolving concept is very present here. And it's something that um, will transform the understanding of what a museum can do, uh, what an art exhibition can do, and how it kind of like connects to the history of exhibitions, but also the history of a city, the history of the world, the history of science and art together. present an equal sense of all the cities that I've chosen. It doesn't even matter if my presence there is real and the other one is a copy. It's like Freudian dreams. It's all the things you know. And art is about things you don't know. Not about things that someone has invented or created, but about things that no one has noticed. Presence is open for collaboration with people who are interested in investigating the possible aftermaths of the project. If you want to learn more about the open call, subscribe to our newsletter. The beta version of Presence is coming in 2020. Everyone, so we'll, we will begin again with the second and third projects of this afternoon. So if everyone could take their seats, we'll, we'll get going. And so, staring into the black slabs in our hands, we don't only see ourselves and we don't only see the future, sometimes we indeed see the past. And as has been said, sometimes the past is more unpredictable than the future. Konstantin Sylkowski, who will la reappear later today, um, regarded as the father of Russian rocketry and aeronautics, uh, someone who in many ways really made the Soviet space program possible also believed in ethereal beings or non-human intelligences uh, were trying to communicate with humans through symbols. His and other so-called esoteric Russian technical traditions may show up and haunt the present and how the present gives voice to things. The song, in other words, evolves in relation to how much meaning the singer hopes to contain within it. Podkop is a project exactly about this phenomenon of voice, in this case, as channeled through the written word. A certain past leaks through, and we leak through the city in accordance with it. Podkop is also building a model, in this case, several training models that teach and learn through the medium of human text and social media interfaces. The urban technologies that it leverages are the channels afforded to us by platforms colloquially known as social media. And on the surface of it, the project proposes a chatbot, or several actually. Beneath the surface though, you could call it a game or a conversation and while these are true, this game is actually playing the player. More precisely, particular 
environmental cosmologies built of specific sensory inputs and cultural signifiers and logics. The urban design here is in the choreography of this distributed cognitive engine that learns from how it is taught to write. And by that, I mean both the bot, the person, the past, and the moment now. So my pleasure to welcome Podcop. My name is Natalia Tushkevich. I'm a philosopher and a computational linguist. I'm Tony Yannick. I'm a philosopher, media artist, and engineer. I'm Valdez Silens. I'm a foresight strategist from Canada. Uh, I'm Hira. I'm an architect from Pakistan. And this is uh, Patkap. In the summer of 2018, residents of Moscow began receiving strange messages on Telegram, machine-generated text. Suddenly, the silence was broken. What is this? Electricity tickled through. Strange noses appear and disappear. I started to think, where it come from and why? And why? You don't need to do anything. It isn't necessary to worry. I need to speak to somebody to find a way. Too many questions, too much of everything. I need to start moving if take into account the mental state. Then be moving backwards. Be moving backwards and forwards and back. back. We arrive at Metro We arrive at Metro 2, then a glint in the river. The city beneath the city beneath the city. There is no need of it. There is no need of a ticket. system called Pudcop had infiltrated the metro underground. 
abducting users with interactive fictions, it accessed sensors in the metro, like CCTV cameras, to give shape to its stories, which it would build using the myths and cosmologies of the metro underground. We began our investigation. We started to research the system to see how its components related. Over the past few months, we've collected those traces and reversed engineered what we could, slowly building a diagram of what we understand, to the best of our knowledge, of its six software functions, which it has been ceaselessly repeating. First, it accessed sensors in the city from which it pulled data in real time. It would select a few of these, seemingly at random, but increasingly with a purpose of its own, like it was playing. It would then integrate these into a model mapping the metaphoric links between them. Then it would gather and frame its cultural knowledge, histories and cosmologies that would shape its synthetic personality. It would use these inputs to construct interactive fictions populated by generative rules, environments, and stories. These interactive fictions would then be propagated to users across different media and messaging platforms. The interactions and reactions it generated would help the system to adopt new policies, shaping how it selected and framed its next cycle. Only when we had outlined this did we really begin to understand. It was a system that used the ubiquitous sensing infrastructure of the city to generate stories about itself. It created synthetic personalities built from the cultural cosmologies it remembered and recombined. And it treated culture as an interface to people playing with their biosemiotics like any other thing in the world, a medium through which to learn about it. We've watched it spread over the last year. It forks, adapts, recombines the sensing inputs it finds interesting, the cosmologies it finds useful, and the platforms on which it proliferates. In December of last year, it appeared in the South, in Japan, at the Fukushima Exclusion Zone. It seemed to have cultivated an interest in zones devoid of people and cultures apart from the human. The first clue was a sudden spiking of IP addresses requesting radiation heat maps of the zone, followed by scientists reporting their wearable device batteries were draining quicker than normal, ones attached to animals monitoring their movements and chemo sensors on plants monitoring their signaling. After the interactions began propagating on the LINE platform, users noted similarity to the writings of Hiroki Azuma and his interest in recombinant media, metaphorically linked to the mutations in the zone. Two months later, it appeared again across the Pacific, in Los Angeles. Here, early adopters of ingestible sensors had their data compromised, while new algorithms for monitoring stress through sentiment analysis began appearing online, and information about the movement of food through the LA port, stressed by drought, was collected. We believe it was investigating across scales, looking for crisscrosses between gut bacteria, the city, and the planetary. Propagating its interactions across Instagram, it seemed to have absorbed the cosmologies of West Coast singularitarianism and their interests in overcoming the body. As we collected these stories and deciphered their operations, we attracted attention from the media Earlier in the month, after a news report about our research, we received an email. I'll read it here. As you may already know, in the 1960s, a group of computer scientists on the outskirts of Kiev founded the Institute for Cybernetics. Here, for 20 years, they would imagine alternative technologies, like a smart neural network for the economy, virtual currencies, paperless offices, and natural language processing techniques for semantic interaction. Seeing themselves as independent of Moscow, they developed an entire virtual republic they deemed Cybertonia, complete with fake passports, wedding certificates, newspapers, 
and a constitution. This alternative cosmotechnical lineage, which we trace from the cosmos in the 1890s to technology and projectionism in the 20s, would splinter and go underground in the 1970s, with inventors tinkering in their garages and sharing technologies across DIY networks, and programmers leaving cities to join back to the land groups in the 2000s, distributing their alternative technological diagrams. But the traces of this lineage in the texts they wrote and the techniques they developed remain there, waiting to be unearthed. The email was unsigned, but it contained a key that so far we only know to be decipherable by Podkop. Okay, thank you. So, on behalf of uh the team with Hira and Baldus. Um, Natasha and I are going to tell you a little bit about uh, a little bit behind what PodCop is and how we develop such a thing. So we want to walk you through a little bit of a demo, a little bit about how the software works, and hopefully lead up to some questions that we can discuss. So um, as, we, as, we, as we talked about in the video, right? The software here works on a bunch of sensors. And here I can log in and uh, get access to the cameras here at Straka. <laughs> right. So vision is one of the things. There's CCTV. There's, there's vision everywhere, right? Um, but if this, we have a reinforcement learning bot, and if it's learning and it's just basically choosing random sensors or choosing sensors between it, right? How does it make sense of such a thing? How does it know um, how to tell stories uh, about vision and how you might feel today or how my gut is? So we tried to experiment with these sorts of uh, with these sorts of things. So this is just a little bit past, it's a frozen image. But if we can detect, right, so simple vision algorithm, running object detection, right? But what it has is, shoot, 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 there. So if we look on the, on the left side of the screen, it's attempting to create samples based on uh, there's five different cameras in here, and we're using them correctly right now. And currently, it's uh, trying to do this. And but Natasha will show uh, a little bit more about really uh, how it uses this technologies. Okay, thank you. And you could think that Podcop is total speculation as many other things are, but actually it's real. Uh, and I have contacted Podcop, or Pod, Podcop contacted me. Podcop actually abducted me to the game. And I've been playing this for a while, so now I'm not a developer anymore, I'm a player. Here we are with this Podcop continuing the game. And I... So you, I'm showing the, you the Telegram interface, the messenger. And it's the place where Podcop learns about the world through the interaction with people. Now I'm learning Podcop, but also I try, I'm trying to understand what's going on in his world or her. So I press continue. And it, I'm continuing the game. You're proceeding the game, Tish. Type inventory to see what you collected, it says. Inventory. I do have one artifact. You already seen it in the film. It's the combined map of the so-called Metro 2. It seems all the lines are intersecting at the Biblioteca Imeni Lenina station. Let's go there. Now we are at Kropotkinska. So first, I want to see where could I go from there. So it's basically the red line, every Moscovite can recognize it, all these stations. But also there is some person, as 
Podkov said. Let's talk to, to him. It's Alexander Brodsky, um, architect and conceptual artist and creator of the paper architecture. And surprisingly, he also starts talking about the secret underground net network probably still used by FSB. He winks, hinting that he can give me something, okay? What could it be? Take an object. I actually can't really see what's going on there, but it seems that uh, in the corner there is his name, and um, maybe Podkov can tell me more. Okay, this is the plan of the Pushkinstead Museum reconstruction. Um, you can see the size of the underground levels that are playing into use. It's only a piece from a bigger picture of what they're doing underground now. Okay, yeah, I know this from the Podkop because he always sending me these maps from Metro 2, some other underground things, uh, also about Polytechnical Museum, surprisingly. So finally I see the button go to the Blachekli Milenina. Okay, let's go there. Um, I came to the Blachekli Milenina station but now I see that he's sending me some weird messages, some labyrinth inside the library, some way out. Okay, where are you taking me, Podkop? He's rude, too many questions, too much of everything. I need to start moving, if taking into account the metal state. It's kind of weird fiction, right? The city beneath the city, Metro Tun, the Niglinda River, no need of a ticket. I want you to make research there, finally. The archivist can help you. Okay, talk to the archivist. AI, the archivist. He's the one who knows these stories. You can talk to him to know more about Metro 2, presumably the level of Moscow life where you navigate now. Okay, maybe now I can ask something by myself. What's going on? What's going on? What is he doing with myself? Uh, what are all these bunkers? Tunnels, vaults, how it's connected to the museums and stories from Soviet times. Okay, he's going to the archive and also saying that I can travel to any other station. But I already did travel a lot on this podcop system. Oh, he's answering. What are they? Is it a museum, a monument? I don't know if I like the monuments or what. I just don't think I can imagine it. I had to check my phone. Okay, the archivist and the AI also has a phone. My phone was dead. Actually, it's true because the buzzer there is really bad, so I almost couldn't open this telegram now. Where did you get it from? What happened to them when they went down there? Where they did get artifacts? Yeah, it's a good question. How did they get in the buildings around them? I don't know really, he says. I should go look for a job. <laughs> Maybe to see MD Abduti. No, the first thing to do is the museum's grounds. Yeah, it's true. They're in the far north of town. It actually resembles all the maps that were around. How do you see these buildings? They're kind of small, just like the rest of the building, but bigger, maybe as much as the five-story windows this tower. And bunkers, what are the bunkers on the outskirts? A museum, 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 gallery, show me the museum. Okay, finally you got it, I hope. I hope, because it is generating constantly right now and it can proceed for a while, so it's better to start, to start Q&A now. Thank you. Okay, so we will we reached the uh, the end of the the presentations for the third year uh, and final year of the new normal. We will end with a project that links up very closely with where we began yesterday. At the beginning of our presentations, we we began by asking, in what ways is it that a nation occupies a territory versus how that nation actually is that territory. Now, for Russia, this, uh, Russia may be a special case in this regard, but not entirely. We will conclude uh, the presentation by considering how it is 
that a nation, in this case Russia, beca became and continues to become real through the designing of the land and more specifically its earth and sky. The title comes from once more from Konstantin Salkovsky who has uh, haunted our program for the last three years or so. All of this changes the equation but only uh, slightly but decisively. A nation is not the same thing as a state jurisdiction. It is not only the drawing of lines on a map, nor the land that the lines are drawn about. Finally, a nation is not only that which designs its land, the nation may emerge from the project of physically transforming the earth. The earth is folded in such a way that a nation sprouts and then, in most cases, spreads like pollen far and wide. That is, the notion is not soil and blood. Nations like Homo sapiens are always reformulating and migrating and replacing themselves. They are both the effect of a world-making project and also, at the same time, much more rootless than some would have it. So the project you'll see now deals directly with the Russian project, but the lesson is more general. If what has been called the Anthropocene now appears to us as a two-century-long feat of headless geoengineering, then the alibi that we could somehow not deliberately decide how to occupy a planet seems both naive and dangerous. At this moment, as design in its broadest sense is only beginning to confront what planetarity may mean and demand, if forming the Earth at the relatively local scale begets a nation, then what comes from that same initiative at planetary scale? In other words, the program ahead is also a remaking of Earth and Sky, but if not one nation, what is the society that emerges from this planetary project? That question, uh, specifically, will be one that animates the next program here at Strelka that we will announce this August. But until then, let's tell the story of how we got here, and indeed how here got here, so, of Earth and Sky. Hi, I'm George. I'm an architect and geographer from Athens, Greece. Hello, my name is Anna. I'm a designer and artist from Berlin, Germany. Hi, my name is Alexander. I'm an artist, engineer. I'm from Russia. Hello, I'm Alessa from Ukraine, and we present in Of Earth and Sky. This is the promotional video. Um, sorry. This is a promotional video of a new territorial development project. Spanning an area of six Dubais, uh, the virgin lands in nor northwestern Saudi Arabia, um, where some Sinasin have been pitched as a territory of endless potential. Large-scale transformation is not new, uh, but it's becoming all the more conscious and all the more planetary. Um, the 11 uh, sub-Saharan African countries are now building the cross-continental green belt to stop um, the expansion of Sahara Desert. And in a similar manner, China, uh, for the past 40 years, has been constructing the largest man-made forest, um, so far counting 66 billion of trees, in an effort to stop the desertification that country itself caused by uh, huge deforestation and intense uh, agricultural practices. And uh, scaling up from the territory to the continent and to the planet, proposals to engineer the climate and to mitigate uh, global heating are now being seriously considered as a viable alternative by international bodies like IPCC, um, creating the aerosols um, uh, umbrellas, uh, flooding the oceans with iron, and um, uh, constructing the whiter clouds, 
uh, all our interventions of large scale and effort. And if one thing has become um, uh, apparent with uh, planetary issues like uh, climate change, is that interventions, our interventions of large scale have effects uh, beyond borders. Uh, and therefore, um, <clears throat> territorial uh, ambitions may well come to conflict with other contradicting ideals. And for example, not everybody uh, wants to stop the melting of the ice cap. Some see it uh, as an opportunity for world trade. Not everybody thinks that CO2 emissions contribute to uh, global heat, and some rebrand it as a molecule of freedom. Not everybody uh, considers Amazon to be carbon sink. Some see it as an obstacle for development. Yeah, right. So, to move forward and to continue engineering the Earth, uh, we need to look beyond the ephemeral geopolitical stakes. We need to see, we need to understand the formation of the environment as a nation-building practice, which also works vice versa. The specific nation construction informs the landscape in a specific way. For example, we cannot think of the low countries without their specific way of reclaiming the land, of constructing, um, of constructing polders and pumping windmills. With a quarter of their territory below the level of the sea, the Dutch would not exist without their native way of terraforming, and vice versa. The specific artificial landscape informs their Dutchness. Similarly, similarly, we can think of other examples. The Helvetian Republic celebrated the drainage of marshlands in the Linth Valley as a symbol of Swiss national unification, while the American identity is tightly connected to projects like the interstate highway system and the dams network. In this relation between the formation of the environment and nation building, Russia not only is no exception, but we can say it is an exemplar. Особенная архитектура. Географическая инженерия континентального масштаба. Геодизайн. Строитель. Теперь это амбициозный геолог. Креативный топограф, увлеченный чтением климатолог. Геосфера и атмосфера в равной степени становятся источниками материала, камней лесов и рек, но также облаков, взвешенных частиц и электромагнитных волн. Но на этой планетарной стройке методы не универсальны. Ощущения и искривление ландшафта становятся практиками строения нации, очерчивающими особые вернокуляры. Растянувшиеся на 11 часовых поясов искусственные рельефы России смастерены с особой логикой. Выходя за пределы антропогенных геометрий, исчерчивающих сушу, Русский геодизайн смотрит ввысь, осознавая потенциал атмосферных потоков. Не только терраформинг, но также 
эфира форминг. В масштабе этой страны геодизайн пересекает границы и преодолевает различия между государственными землями и глобальностью территории. В амбициозности порыва не просто отличить науку от вымысла. Воображение становится фирменным секретом, необходимым для воплощения. Книги «Грезы о земле и небе» родоначальник космонавтики Константин Циолковский косвенно работал над основаниями грандиозного проекта земных преобразований. Название и между строк его космических путешествий заключена суть российского вернокуляра геодизайна. Во взаимодействии между Землей и небом, объединенных наукой и вынесли. So, um, because of the scale of the transformation of the environment and its unique history with environmental modifications, we reframe Russia. We reframe Russia as an artificial land, an artificial territory in itself, and we look closer to see the particular ways in which this artifice has been shaped. That is what we call the geodesign vernacular the specific logic and the native way in which the Russian landscape has been shaped. The earth and sky for us is not a binary, rather we use this in order to emphasize that for the Russian geodesign, transformation is not only about land but also about skies, the climate, the weather, space, the ionosphere. We'll try to unpack uh, quickly this argument of earth and sky and to tell this story one may start from uh, the beginnings of the 18th century when uh, a new city was founded on the marshlands of the Neva Delta, uh, St. Petersburg, a city that basically forced the unwelcoming terrain to be made habitable by Peter the Great. The creation logic of what Dostoevsky called the most premeditated city in the world would then be exported to the level of the territory. And this crafting exploration of the pit lungs, of the, of, of the waterlogged soils made the way for new geographic builders. And we could summarize them in the figures of the geologist and the climatologist to correspond to this earth-sky di dynamic that we're trying to set up. First, the earth sciences uh, drew attention in the 19th century Reverse, yep. uh, in parallel to the expedition for, dra for, drainage, for the drainage expedition and swamp drainage that continued, escalated to, towards the end of the 19th century and continued during the Soviet times. At the same time, large schemes for both conservation and transformation of the environment took place um, with forest reserves um, um, uh, uh, power plants, cascades, um, new reservoirs, and other transformation of nature. In the 20th century, the geologist was celebrated uh, as an equal figure to that of the cosmonaut, 
thinking of the geologist who traverses and explores new landscapes as the cosmonaut who explores new planets. On the other hand, swamp drainage um, also kept the climatologist busy. Uh, from his first, um, from, from the most ca more casual map making, um, he, he went on to, uh, he set out to the fields to guarantee the preservation of the water cycle. And then in the beginning of the 20th century, climatologists and atmosphere, atmospheric scientists involved, were more involved into um, the transformation of the environment, starting experimentations with weather manipulation, which then escalated to climate modification, experiments that continue up until this day. Now, if we bring together um, these events of actual geodesign on the Russian territory, and we also enrich the timeline with science climate fiction of the 20th century, cosmist ideas and the imaginary and, and ideology around this transformation of the environment, we may weave numerous stories speaking and describing the particular character of the Russian vernacular. And we're going to narrate one of these stories. A certain ring around the earth. First, in 1958, then, two years later, two similar proposals to wrap the earth in metallic potassium particles and dust were published in academic journals in the Soviet Union. By placing a Saturn ring around the earth, as articles suggested the name, Mikhail Gorotsky and Valentin Cherenkov hoped to increase the solar radiation reaching the Arctic Circle to artificially control the climate in the region. The proposals seemed so outrageously ambitious that it must have been an unusual encounter for scientific publications. A book published in 1960 entitled Man vs. Climate popularized these proposals featuring their illustrations in its cover. The book weaved scientific and fictitious proposals of similar attitude to tame the climate. A history dating as far back as in 1835, when the futuristic novel Year 4338 was published, including one of the first descriptions of holistic climate control. As a serious scientific inquiry, Climate modification had escalated from experimentations with weather manipulation, an intensive study that started as early as in 1919 in the Soviet Union. Shooting with cannons to the clouds, these technologies were put in application to mitigate hail rains near the Caucasus from the mid-50s onwards, starting from the fertile Alazani valleys of Georgia. Funded by the Ministry of Agriculture, the control of the weather was informing the material activities on the ground. But more than that, a proposal for climate modification in the Arctic now had the potential to manipulate a whole territory of significant importance for the planet, terraforming the northern ice cap and melting the permafrost would be a massive anthropogenic intervention. As the analysis of the day showed, the annihilation of the ice cover of the Arctic would be permanent. Once destroyed, it would never be re-established. Beyond geopolitics, the Arctic had always been in the crosshairs of both Russians and Americans because of the icy hardship it caused to the highest latitudes. Rerouting warm ocean streams and creating huge dams to control the Arctic inflow were only two among many proposals of American and Soviet engineers. But the Saturn Ring proposal was different. It didn't deal with physical infrastructures and the oceans. It stepped out of this earth to construct a cosmic shade. The Soviets had just managed to send the first artificial satellite in orbit, taking the lead against the Americans in the space race. The fellow traveler sent the first radio signals from space, bringing this all-encompassing imaginary that allowed scientists to see beyond the stratosphere. 
scaling up weather control meant a second victory for the Soviets. They proceeded in framing its large-scale effects as climate control, uncovering the potential of transboundary repercussions of their technology. The 22nd Congress of the Communist Party in 1961 set climate control as an issue of urgent priority, while the notions of the air and the atmosphere were added in the official definition of nature. Acting in the scale of the country was now acting for the planet. Gorotsky and Cherenkov indeed acknowledged that their particle umbrella would shade the equator, mitigating their monsoons in the respective regions. For that reason, they claimed their proposal would be beneficial for all humanity. This was only one of the stories one can narrate to uncover the dynamic of earth and sky. Many more stories can be potentially built, each one addressing distant events and focusing on different parts of this history. A story that also weaves through events, fiction and ideology. But all of them speak of the potential of a particular geodesign vernacular. Of Earth and Sky is a repository for such stories. This structure or the website guides you through different aspects of Russian geodesign vernacular, which are represented in the synopsis. It provides multiple lenses uh, to explore each of them by offering a number of stories. Each story intertwines lenses from the timeline, nar narrating histories. But also, each story speaks for itself. One can on just swim in the database pool. And by recognizing new patterns and revealing causalities, create their own stories. Through time, we aim to build a complex archive, which informs back the ways of how his histories can be read and constructed by an individual. Earth and Sky, that are you. Our website prototype is already there. All right, and to conclude, if the fabrication of the land is the fabrication of the nation, then there are specific cosmologies and cosmotechnics which construct distinct vernaculars. If the Earth is a planetary construction site, then the techniques and technologies of environmental modification are interwoven with culture. After a long time of accidentally aggregated transformation of the environment, geodesign becomes an issue we need to engage with in order to build the depth of conceptual understanding that we need to understand its implications and perform it in a way that will not be catastrophic. A peculiar architecture in itself, geodesign asks us to consider new governance models, new practices, and new politics that we need but don't yet have. Thank you.